Good morning, people. This is, uh, I am recording this on Friday morning, February 5. I'm going to be posting it February 7. So here's a sermon for February 7. Uh, we are still in this uh, meeting virtually with me recording sermons. I'm uh, going to do that for a few more weeks, although the, the numbers for Michigan are coming down well. A number of our people have had their first vaccines. Um, Laurel and I supposedly have uh, immunity for a while anyway. We had COVID. You know, it's a good thing I recorded a couple of these sermons ahead of time because uh, a few weeks ago I caught COVID, spent five days in the hospital, still gaining my strength back. So. We won't start meeting face to face for a couple of weeks yet. I want to gain my strength back, but um, looking to possibly start uh, meeting face to face again at Master Arts on Sunday mornings, but uh, not this week yet, February 7. Here's our sermon for the day. Okay, this I've been going through the book of Ruth. We've had seven, eight sermons in the book of Ruth. Finishing up this series today. This will be the end of uh, the book of Ruth. Um, you remember the story Elimelech and Naomi moved to Moab because of uh, famine in the land. And Elimelech died, the two sons married, and then the two sons died. Uh, Naomi came back, one daughter-in-law stayed, but Ruth came back with her. And as is prescribed in the uh, law, um, a kinsman redeemer was to redeem Naomi's land and also marry Ruth and raise a child to her husband who had passed away. So this is the end of that. You remember when they came back, Naomi had said to the ladies of Bethlehem, don't call me Naomi, which meant um, pleasant, but call me Mara, which meant bitter. So she had had some bitterness against what the Lord had done to her. Hey, this uh, message today also includes a, a genealogy at the end. Very similar. We're going to compare that genealogy with Matthew's genealogy um, that um, Ruth and the son that they had, Obed, was um, a part of the lineage of David and a part of the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So here's my humor for today. Genealogist. See, it contains a genealogy. So I got some genealogy uh, humor here. My ancestors are so hard to find. They must have been in a witness protection program. <laughs> There's a fella trying to find some of his ancestry and can't find anything because they were in the witness protection program. Or another one. Eventually, all genealogists come to their census. <laughs> Not to their senses, but to their senses. Genealogists, the only people who are excited to read obituaries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now I'm reading obituaries to find your past. Genealogy is like hide and seek. They hide and we seek to find them. I'm not stuck. I'm ancestrally challenged. Yeah, these are all genealogists who are finding, trying to find their past family. I think I got one more here. No, I didn't. Okay, here is our text. Ruth, the end of chapter 4. Ruth, chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Let me read this text for you. Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. Talking about this new grandson to Naomi. He shall be to you a restorer of life 
and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child, that's a wonderful verse, then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became her nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him the name saying, gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, the, now we got genealogy here at the end. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Solomon. Solomon fathered Boaz. By the way, Solomon's wife was Rahab the harlot that they, uh, the story in Joshua when they conquered the land. Solomon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse, Jesse fathered David. All right, here's my outline. First of all, verse 13, marriage and a grandchild. Marriage and a grandchild. Point number two, the Bethlehem women's doxology. There's recorded here a two-verse doxology that they give to Naomi over this new grandson that was born. Verses 14 and 15. Point number three, Naomi becomes a grandma to him. Verse 16, verse 17, the Bethlehem women name him. Isn't that interesting? We're going to talk about that. Naomi didn't name him. Ruth didn't name him. Boaz didn't name him. The Bethlehem women named him. Um, point number five, the genealogy of this child at the end of the chapter, the end of the book, actually puts this genealogy there. All right, point number one, marriage and a grandchild. Verse 13, she Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. You remember last week's message? He redeemed her. He went to the um, kinsman redeemer who was closer and the other kinsman redeemer took off his shoe, did not want to uh, fulfill his responsibility. He turned it over to Boaz and Boaz, um, bore witness to the elders in the gate of the city of Bethlehem. And now um, he took her as wife. So Boaz took Ruth and he, she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Okay, I got some comments here on this verse. Boaz had fulfilled his responsibility as the kinsman redeemer uh, to Naomi with the land and to Ruth as the um, the wife of the of the close relative. The Lord blessed them and gave them a child. With her first husband, her womb had been closed. She could not conceive, did not have any children. He passed away and there he was, a widow with no children. There she was, Ruth. Uh, she could not, she did not conceive with her first husband. Now the Lord gave her conception, it said. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. This first son of theirs was not Boaz, but Boaz, Boaz's son, but legally he was the son of the first husband of Ruth so that the seed could continue on, the name could continue on. Um, but Physically, uh, biologically, he was the son of Boaz. Um, legally, he was the son of the first husband who'd passed away. Here's cross-reference. Deuteronomy chapter 25, again, the Liverite marriage. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, that's what happened, his widow must not marry outside of the family. Don't go find somebody, uh, some other uh, family, but stay within the family. Her husband's brother, or as we find in other passages, closest relative, her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law. 
to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. So that's what we have. We have uh, Boaz, who well, was not the brother, but was the closest kinsman redeemer. We looked at those passages in the law. He married Ruth, and now they had a son. The Lord gave conception, and this first son was to carry on the name of uh, her her husband who had passed away so that his name would not be blotted out of Israel. Uh, other comments. In Scripture, God is in control of conception and bearing children. Throughout the Bible, it states over and over again that God gave conception and women get pregnant because of the Lord. You have a young couple and they're married, been married a while, trying to have children and they and they don't they they can't get pregnant and they wonder why. Well, pray about it. The Bible shows us over and over. I'm going to show some examples here. Here are some examples I say that the Lord is the one who is in control of the conception for a new baby. Okay, here's cross-reference, Hebrews chapter 11, 11, okay, way back at references, you remember Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, but this reference is back to when Sarah had a child, and by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, he was very elderly, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. The Lord caused Sarah to conceive even in her old age, well past conception years. Uh, Genesis 25, 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. Here they were trying to have children. She was child. Throughout the Bible, they always wanted to have children. And and many times when they didn't, they sought the Lord. Here we have Isaac praying about it. He prays for his wife because she was childless. Notice this. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. So the Lord had control of her conception. Here's a couple more verses. Psalm 113.9. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay. So he is the one who allows the woman to become a mother of children. And then, of course, uh, there are other passages. Here's one in Luke with uh, uh, John the Baptist. And they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Now don't jump down to verse 13. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and you shall call him John. So again, Throughout scripture, the Lord is in control of the process of being able to have a baby. All right, point number two, the Bethlehem women's doxology. These ladies have played an important part throughout this book. Uh, they were Naomi's friends. You remember Bethlehem was a small town and everybody knew everybody else. And and when Naomi came back, they were the ones who said, oh, look, it's Naomi. And Naomi said to them, no, call me Mara. Well, here they, at the end of the book, they knew what grandchildren meant. And they bring this doxology in verses 14 and 15. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed, there's a doxology, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. So they're saying, Lord, you are to be blessed. You're to be praised because you brought this new grandchild into Naomi's household. You carried on the name. And they say, may his name be renowned. May he become a very 
well-known, famous person in Israel. And he did because he was in the lineage of David and the lineage of Christ. He shall be to you, talking about Naomi, he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. Remember, she had become bitter. She felt the Lord had treated her unfairly. Now these women are saying, oh, look, Naomi, here's a grandson who's going to restore life and is going to nourish and help you in your old age so that you're not bitter against the Lord anymore. And then it says, they said, these women of Bethlehem say, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, here she was a Moabitess, married in, stayed with her. Remember that famous quote from her, may your people become my people and your God become my God. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. I don't know how many of you listening uh, are, are grandparents, but my wife and I are grandparents, and we just love our grandkids. They're, such, they're so wonderful. I can see Naomi with this young child and how much this young child meant, and these women of Bethlehem pronouncing this doxology. I got some comments. These women of Bethlehem, Naomi's friends, give a blessing on Naomi and the child. They say that this grandson will be a restorer of life to Naomi and a nourisher to her in her old age. She was bitter, she was, she was feeling down, now this grandson, they pronounce that he will be a restorer of life to her. This is an important statement. You remember that Naomi struggled with bitterness. She felt that the Lord had treated her wrongly. Lord, my husband died. My two sons died. I have no offspring. You have treated me bitterly, she felt. But now... This grandson will help restore her relationship with the Lord. That's an important statement. This grandson will help restore her relationship with the Lord. Maybe you're bitter. Just wait. The Lord is going to bless you. The Lord is going to be with you. Don't let a root we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Don't let a root of bitterness destroy your relationship with the Lord. All right, point number three. Naomi becomes a grandma to him. Verse 16, a little short verse, but just a wonderful verse. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became her nurse. Now, the word nurse doesn't mean here that she nursed him, although I'm sure from a, you know, a nursing bottle, she, she fed him, but became a, a caretaker for the little child. You can just see the grandma loving this child and taking the child, laying the child on her lap, and the Lord just melted her heart. The bitterness was gone because the Lord had given to her now this wonderful offspring bitter no more but pleasant again i said here you remember when naomi returned to bethlehem she told those women not to call her pleasant her name naomi meant pleasant but to call her mara bitter she was angry at how the lord had treated her she felt the Lord had treated her unfairly and that her husband died, her sons had died, and there was grief in her, in her life. Now, as time went on in her life, things have changed. Now she has a wonderful grandchild, and that just melted her heart. She feels the goodness of the Lord. These women say to Naomi that this grandson is more to you than seven, son. All right, point number four. The Bethlehem women name him. Isn't that interesting? Verse 17. 
The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Isn't that interesting? It seemed to have been a practice in biblical times that it wasn't the parents who necessarily named the child, but they got they got suggestions. They they it was the friends and the family that named the child. I say here, Obed means servant or a serving one. Some feel it is a shortened form of Obadiah, servant of the Lord. Remember, we have a prophet named Obadiah, and this Obed could have been a shortened form of that. A servant, he certainly did serve the Lord. It was common in biblical times for neighbors and relatives to suggest names for a new child. Remember Luke chapter 1. Um, John the Baptist was born, and the neighbors wanted John uh, to, to be named after his father. And of course, his father had received special instruction from the angel that he was to be called John, but the neighbors were giving suggestions for them to be named. Naomi had lost her two sons earlier in a foreign country. Now she has been given some offspring, a grandson. Then we have a reminder of a brief genealogy of Obed. He was the grandfather of David. So the book, again, the book of Ruth was written um, some years after it occurred. It occurred early in the period of the judges uh, because it has David. It does not have Solomon, but it does have David. So it was written sometime after Saul had been king and now David was king and the book uh, is written uh, during the sometime during the period of David when David is king in Israel. Wonderful story. All right, here's a cross reference of uh, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son and her neighbors and relatives, there they are, neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they would have called him Zachariah after his father. But his mother answered, no, he should be called John. So isn't that interesting that often the neighbors would, would and the family, what does it say? Neighbors and relatives were the ones who, who actually brought the name for the child. We see that with um, Obed. We see that with uh, Boaz and Ruth's child. They named him Obed, a servant. He, they knew he was going to be a servant of the Lord. Here's something to think about. I was thinking about this as I was uh, as I was uh, dealing with this. Second Corinthians chapter one, verses three and four. Notice this verse: "Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion." And the God of all comfort, the God of all comfort, okay? He comforts us when we go through difficult times. Who comforts us in all our troubles so that, God has a purpose for comforting us, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from the Lord. Now, that not that interesting? If you take this principle, this verse, Paul says that this is true. And you bring it back to Naomi. Naomi had gone through some very difficult times. Naomi had found bitter, had, had had bitterness towards the Lord. But then the Lord gave her comfort with this grandchild. Here's some comments. Did Naomi become a great comfort to others? Here you get the small town of Bethlehem. Everybody knew everybody else. Whenever, here, Naomi had gone through terrible loss in her life. For a period of time, she had become bitter with the Lord. Now, it seems, she has found the comfort uh, from the Lord with this grandchild in the small town of Bethlehem. Now, here, did Naomi become a lady who could greatly minister to others? 
Say there was a widow lady who just lost her husband. I can just see Naomi going over there and visiting and saying, you know, I went through this and the Lord helped me through it. Or maybe a young mother who loses her child, Naomi going over there and saying, you know, I lost both of my children, but the Lord helped me through it. I think Naomi became a great person of comfort in the small town of Bethlehem. Whenever a woman lost her husband or lost a child, I'll bet that Naomi would have, be the first to go to them and to share the comfort that she had received from the Lord. Now, we do not have scripture that says that, but that principle in the New Testament teaches us that that happens. And I think that must have happened to Naomi. All right, the last here, the end of the book. All right, tacked on the end of the book is a genealogy. We're going to talk about genealogies a little bit. Now, these are the genealogies. The gen, I'm sorry. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. You know, it's very interesting as you study this. Um, Salmon was Boaz's father. You look in the genealogy of Matthew, which we're going to in just a little bit. Salmon married Rahab the harlot. Rahab was a Canaanite, and you remember helped the spies hid them on her roof and was rescued, and she became a Jewish lady uh, with Gentile blood, uh, married Salmon, and they had a child, Boaz. Boaz became a very godly man, as we've seen in this book. So Rahab, who, who came as a Gentile, came into a relationship with the Lord, seems to have been a very godly mother to Boaz. Um, and, not, and, then, and then Boaz married Ruth. So you got Naomi uh, as a grandma to Obed, and you got Rahab as a grandma to Obed. And Ur Obed learned how to be a servant to the Lord. Cross-reference. Here's, here's the genealogy, uh, the same genealogy in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Two to the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. There's another story. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Now notice this. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. So Matthew actually sticks that clause in there and reminds us that um, Boaz's mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse and Jesse, the father of King David. Isn't it interesting? Rahab was uh, genial, um, bloodline-wise. Rahab was a Gentile. Ruth was a Moabite, a Gentile. Um, uh, they certainly in, uh, influenced the bloodline of David. And, of course, David's bloodline came down to be part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Uh, interesting fact about biblical genealogies here. There may be people missing from genealogies because the word fathered can also mean uh, fathered an ancestor of. That's important to remember. Sometimes you say, well, this timeline doesn't seem to match up. How could, you know, one generation be uh, 200 years? Well, when, a lot of times when the genealogies say so-and-so fathered, so-and-so, that meant that they were the great-grandfather of. So you can miss some generations in there. Some prominent genealogies in the Bible we have in Genesis chapter 5. That's kind of an important one. Early um, genealogies, Genesis chapter 10, 
Here we have Ruth chapter 4, the genealogy, 1 Chronicles, uh, chapters 1 through 10. We have a big, long genealogy. That's what the book of Chronicles is about, uh, the genealogies. And then, of course, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. Much has been made. Well, what's the difference between the genealogy of Matthew 1 and Luke 3? Well, many Bible scholars believe one is the genealogy of Mary, the other is the genealogy of Joseph. The New Testament lists of genealogies of Jesus Christ in two places. Yeah, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. There are not exact replicas of each other because they start at different places. Luke starts at Adam. Matthew starts with Abraham. And each follow a different son of David presumably one from the lineage of Mary and one from Joseph. I had mentioned that. All right, what is the importance of genealogies in the Bible? First, Bible genealogies help confirm the historical reliability of the Bible, okay? The Bible is true, and you can just follow the genealogies right down. Second, the Bible's genealogies reveal the importance of family to God. Your own genealogy is important to God. Each generation have to pick up their own relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Third, the Bible genealogies were also important in determining who could serve in certain roles. Levites uh, could serve in, in roles where others couldn't. So, so that you, you had to prove your genealogies uh, to prove that you could serve in certain roles. Fourth, the Bible genealogies also prove many Bible prophecies. Yes, uh, genealogies prove that Jesus came from the lineage of David, uh, the lineage of the tribe of Judah. So Bible genealogies prove Bible prophecies. And fifth, Bible genealogies also teach how God has used a wide diversity of individuals uh, throughout history, throughout the Old Testament history, and even in the lineage of Jesus Christ. There are Gentiles in the lineage of Jesus Christ showing that God wanted to save Gentiles when Jesus died on the cross. All right, here's my conclusion for this message. The end of the book of Ruth. Naomi, who had been bitter, blamed God, now sees the great mercy of the Lord. And I make that application. Maybe things have happened in your life and you've become bitter towards the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Rely upon him. He will show you his grace and bring you through it. She had been given a wonderful grandchild who is in the genealogy of David and of the Messiah himself. We need to trust in the Lord's justice and grace. He will come through in the end. All right, let's close this message in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this, this whole book of Ruth. We see it focused on Naomi and what she went through and how her heart was hurt and bitterness crept in. And But Father, you proved yourself to her. You proved your grace. May we learn from that lesson. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.